Stand with me. Fight the good fight with all thy might. Three, eight, one. Fight the good fight with all thy might. Christ is thy strength and Christ thy right. Lay hold on life and it shall be thy joy and crown eternally. From the straight race through God's good grace, Lift up thine eyes and seek his face. Life with his way before us lies. Christ is the path and Christ the prize. Cast care aside, lean on thy guide. His boundless mercy will provide. Trust and thy trusting soul shall prove. Christ is its life and Christ its love. Faint not nor fear, his arms are near. He changeth not, and thou art dear. Only believe, and thou shalt see that Christ is all in all to thee. Amen. Brother Mike, could I ask you to open the service in prayer? Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Number 390. 390. I wonder have I done my best for Jesus who died upon the cruel tree to Think of his great sacrifice at Calvary. I know my Lord expects the best from me. How many are the lost that I have lifted? How many are the chained I've helped to free? I wonder have I done my best for Jesus? when he has done so much for me the hours that i have wasted are so many the hours i spent for christ so few because of all my lack of love for jesus i wonder if his heart is breaking too how many are the lost that I have lifted? How many are the chained I've helped to free? I wonder have I done my best for Jesus when he has done so much for me. Verse 4 No longer will I stay within the valley I'll climb to mountain heights above. The world is dying now for want of someone to tell them of the Savior's matchless love. How many are the lost that I have lifted? How many are the chained I've helped to free? I wonder have I done my best for Jesus 
when he has done so much for me. Once again this evening, we will not be passing the plate this Sunday. Probably will start again next Sunday, Lord willing. Of course, I've said things like that before, but nonetheless, uh, we have one out in the vestibule, out in the foyer, if you'd uh, have something to drop in there on your way out. Over a few more songs, or 394, 394, to the work, to the work. 394. <clears throat> To the work, to the work, we are servants of God. Let us follow the path that our master had trod. With the balm of his counsel, our strength shall renew. Let us do with our might what our hands find to do. Toiling on, toiling on. Toiling on, toiling on, let us hope, let us watch and labor till the Master comes. To the work, to the work, let the hungry be fed, to the fountain of life let the weary be led. In the cross and its banner our glory shall be. While they herald the tidings, salvation is free. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on. Let us walk, let us watch, and labor till the Master comes. Verse 3 for the last. To the work, to the work, there is labor for all. For the kingdom of darkness and error shall fall. And the name of Jehovah exalted shall be in the loud swelling chorus. Salvation is free. Toiling on, toiling on. Toiling on, toiling on, let us hope, let us watch, and labor till the Master comes. And over two more, 396, so little time, the harvest will be over. <clears throat> 396. So little time, the harvest will be over. Our reaping done, we reapers taken home. Report our work to Jesus, Lord of harvest. And hope he'll smile, and he'll say, well done. Today we reap or miss the golden harvest. Today is given us lost souls to win. Oh, then to save some dear ones from the burning. Today we'll go to bring some sinner in. How many times I should have strongly pleaded. How often did I feel sweetly warned. The Spirit moved, oh, had I pled for Jesus. The grain is fallen, lost ones not reborn. Today we reap, or miss the golden harvest. Today we've given us lost souls to win. Oh, then to save some near one from the burning. Today we go. To bring some sinner in. Verse 5. The harvest wise with reapers few is wasting. And many souls will die and never know. The love of Christ, the joy of sins forgiven. Oh, let us weep 
and love and pray and go. Today we reap or miss our golden harvest. Today is given us lost souls to win. Oh, then to save some dear ones from the burning. Today we'll go to bring some sinner in. Amen. Thank you, ladies. <clears throat> Appreciate your playing up here. We're going to take our Bibles tonight and turn to the book of Judges again. Book of Judges chapter 11. Judges chapter 11. We have been dealing with the life of Jephthah, just looking into him, comments about his life, lessons that we could learn about his life. And we have taken two Sundays to deal with the first 11 verses of the chapter 11 of the book of Judges, dealing with Jephthah, the ninth judge of Israel. We were in Judges 16 this morning with Samson, the 13th judge of Israel. We are going to pick it up for sake of time in verse number 12. And we are going to read on <clears throat> Judges chapter 11 and verse 12. We've already had a commentary upon his life. Um, he was the son of a harlot. God called him a mighty man of valor. His brothers drove him out of the house. And the men of Gilead, when they got into trouble, came and asked him to be captain and fight against the children of Ammon, who were sniping against them and plundering them for several years. So verse number 12, And Jephthah sent messengers unto the king of the children of Ammon, saying, What hast thou to do with me, that thou art come, up against, come against me to fight in my land? And the king of the children of Ammon answered unto the messengers of Jephthah, because Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt, from Arnon even to, unto Jabuk, and unto Jordan. Now therefore restore those lands again peaceably. And Jephthah sent messengers again unto the king of the children of Ammon, and said unto him, Thus saith Jephthah, Israel took not away the land of Moab, nor the land of the children of Ammon. But when Israel came up from Egypt, and walked through the wilderness under the Red Sea, and came to Kadesh. Then Israel sent messengers unto the king of Edom, saying, Let me, I pray thee, pass through thy land. But the king of Edom would not hearken thereto. And in like manner they sent unto the king of Moab, but he would not consent. And Israel abode in Kadesh. Then they went along through the wilderness, and compassed the land of Edom, and the land of Moab, and came by the east side of the land of Moab, and pitched on the other side of Arnon, but came not within the border of Moab, for Arnon was the border of Moab. And Israel sent messengers unto Sihon king of the Amorites, the king of Heshbon. And Israel said unto him, Let us pass, we pray thee, through thy land into my place. And Sihon trusted not Israel to pass through his coast, but Sihon gathered all his people together, and pitched in Jahaz, and fought against Israel. And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sihon and all his people into the land of Israel, and they smote them. So Israel possessed all the land of the Amorites, the inhabitants of that country, and they possessed all the coasts of the Amorites from Arnon even unto Jabbok, and from the wilderness even unto Jordan. Now unto the Lord God of Israel, now, so... Now the Lord God of Israel hath dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel. And shouldest thou possess it? Wilt not thou possess that which Chemish thy God giveth thee to possess? So whomsoever the Lord our God will drive out from before us, them will we possess. And now art thou anything better than Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel, or did he ever fight against them? While Israel dwelt in Heshbon and in her towns and in Aror and her towns and all the cities that are uh, that be along 
by the coasts of Arnon 300 years. Why therefore did ye not recover them within that time? Wherefore I have not sinned against thee, but thou doest me wrong to war against me. The Lord, the judge, be judged this day between the children of Israel and the children of Ammon. Howbeit the king of uh, the children of Ammon hearkened not unto the words of Jephthah, which he sent him. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Ammon. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord, and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hand, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, then when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hand, and he smote them from Aror, even till thou come to Minneth, even twenty cities, and unto the plain of the vineyards with a gr very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house. And behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me. For I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. And she said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth, for as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. And she said unto her father, this, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months, that I may go up and down upon the mountains and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows. And he said, Go. And he sent her away for two months, and she went with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed, and she knew no man. And it was a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in a year. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this story that you've put within the uh, book of Judges in a time when most turned away from thee in apostasy and deliberate uh, rebellion against thy express will, the law that you had given through Moses. But we see a bright spot here within the life of Jephthah, one who had a hard start who was despised. And so we look to you that you would give us a light for our own life through this story. Pray for your blessing and pray that you be glorified in this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Not to recap too seriously over what I've already uh, gone in the last uh, two Sundays that we dealt with this, but we dealt in the first 11 verses with the character of Jephthah, the clan of Jephthah, the confederacy, the cycle of justice, the conflict, Jephthah being chosen, Jephthah's confusion, then his consent. And now here in verse number 12, we have Jephthah's challenge. Jephthah was known to be a mighty man of valor. That was his, his reputation had he been alive here in America 125 years ago, he would have been one leading the Rough Riders. He would have been one of those that was screaming and hollering as they were going up uh, San Juan Hill, if I have my history uh, remembered correctly there. He didn't mind a good fight. He didn't get muddled in the battle, on the battlefield. He did not get confused. Now, on the other hand, he didn't go looking for trouble. He didn't pick a fight just so that he could fight and prove his prowess. No, but uh, if you brought it to him, you hit a brick wall. You were reckoning with a force. He didn't back down. I think it was uh, 
President Teddy Roosevelt that was credited with the saying with regard to foreign policy, speak softly and carry a big stick. This was uh, Jephthah's foreign policy. Speak softly and carry a big stick. He gave them an opportunity. He, he was, uh, wasn't the type of leader to stand back and let his troops fight the battle while he stood on the hill with his eyeglass giving uh, directions. No, he led his troops. He, they followed him. They gained courage because he was valiant. They echoed his battle cry. And yet we find that he wasn't careless. He didn't fight for fight's sake. So he offered the king of Ammon, who remains unnamed, I might say. You know, it's often good to remain unnamed when you are a loser. <laughs> the king of Ammon, who remains unnamed, he offered him a treaty in a way, a, a way out without embarrassment. He was that uh, uh, marshal that you see on, on, on a TV show here and there who walks into the, the, the factory or the room that's crowded with bad guys with guns and he says, you're all under arrest. He was a force to be reckoned with. We see in verse number 12, the verse that we pick it up here, Jephthah took ownership of this problem. It was my problem. What hast thou to do with me that thou art come down against me to fight in my land? Well, he had been driven out of that land. But when they came and asked him to be their leader and he decided that he would go back and be their leader, he took ownership. He didn't pass the buck. He had uh, President Truman's sign that, that he had on his desk when he was president. The buck stops here. This is my problem. I'm taking ownership. People who face their problems find solutions. People who face their problems, those who ignore their problems and run away, find themselves running for a very long time. And so Jephthah was used to problems his whole life. He didn't have an easy start. He was like David who in his t early teen years had already faced a lion and a bear. We're not told how many uh, wild animals David faced that he didn't stand up to. But we are told who he did stand up to, the lion and the bear. And that, those victories prepared him and gave him energy. And so this is where we find Jephthah. He, he was a, 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 a boy with a troubled youth, a troubled background that just had trouble after trouble after trouble. And, 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 and it, because of those troubles that he faced, he became a man of valor. He's like that... that uh, boy mechanic who grows up driving junkers that are passed down to him and he has problem after problem and what is what kind of a mechanic is he when he grows up he's an excellent one because he's faced every problem that's ever come across there's nothing he doesn't know how to fix and Jephthah he goes to, sends men to the king of Ammon in verse uh, 12 and 13, he says, I didn't start this fight. You picked this fight with me. You came to my land. Uh, I didn't come to yours, so I'm just giving you a way out. Here's your offer. Take it or you'll be sorry because uh, I think you should think twice about this. It's interesting that the Jephthah didn't shift the blame upon the men of Gilead. No, he owned it. It was his these men, he, he could have said, these men of Gilead, they've gotten themselves into this trouble. And you know, king, you know, the way we leaders are, I got to get them out of trouble now. I didn't say that. No, he said, you've come to pick a, pick a fight with me. And real leaders fix the problem, not the blame. Fix the problem. Don't fix the blame. Moving on to verse number 13. How weak and pathetic we see the argument that the king of Ammon sends back. <clears throat> um, because Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt. This had nothing to do with the honor and the heritage of, of, of his people. They were thieves. They were plunderers. They were out to loot. For 18 years they had been sniping against the, the children of Israel. They were like the coward that comes in for a kick once the boy is down. 
And, and, and Israel was weak and Israel was under the judgment of God. And they kept on coming in for 18 years and stealing the treasure and stealing the gold and stealing the crops when they were harvesting them. <clears throat> it was a, simply about greed. Ammon was never a very mighty nation. We don't read too much about the exploits of Ammon. No, most often we see them hiding under the skirts of Moab. Moab and uh, Ammon were sons of Lot with his two daughters. And uh, most often we see Ammon looped in with Moab, maybe sometimes even ruled by Moab. Um, and uh, when, uh, when Israel came out of Egypt, God told Israel not to go up against them because they were distant relations. Don't go up against them. Just leave them alone. Skirt around them. Um, uh, and so they offered to go through their land. And they made this offer. And when, that was, when, when they received the, the uh, no way, then they went around, <clears throat> skirted around to the east. And they left Edom, who was the descendants of Esau, alone. And Moab and Ammon. But um, these nations came out against them. They didn't trust them, and so they came out against them. And when they came out as aggressors, then they did receive a fight. And then they did lose some ground. They did lose some land because they came out and fight, and Israel did do damage against them. But we see in these, in these uh, verses, 14 down through, or 15 down through to 26, 27, we see that uh, Jephthah decides that he is going to get the facts straight and he's going to lay it out. And, and he said, just a minute, king of Ammon, let's get these facts straight. And in all of his history that he cites to him, we don't see any mention of the, of the children of Ammon anywhere. Nowhere. They were not a force to be reckoned with when Israel came out of Egypt and, and came into the, the promised land. And so... He breaks it down very nicely. He says in verse um, 15, Israel didn't take away your land. We didn't take your land. God commanded us not to, and we didn't. Number one, we didn't take your land. Number two, you didn't own this land that you claim to have owned. Now, the king of Ammon sent back, and he claimed a very large tract of land. He said, from the brook, uh, brook um, uh, uh, Arnon up to the brook Jabbok and then over to the Jordan River. Well, the brook Arnon was down halfway down the Dead Sea off on the east side. And the, the brook Jabbok was half, oh, about two-thirds of the way up to the Sea of Galilee over to the, the Jordan River. And he clearly lays it out that they didn't even own any of that. It was the Sihon king of the Amorites that owned that. They were claiming this huge tract of land. And in verse 18, he says, This land that you claim to have owned, some of it belonged to Moab. The rest of it belonged to the king of the Amorites, who we um, offered to let us through, and he didn't. So he said, number three, the land that we did take on the east side of the Jordan River, we took it from Sihon, king of the Amorites. And in fact, all those battles that we fought, you were nowhere to be found. What's all this claim you're making to this land? You were nowhere to be found. We didn't even fight against you. You were already defeated by the Amorites and they took your land. We took the, the land from the Amorites. Yeah, we took it all right, but it wasn't from you. And we gave Sihon, you remember that guy that defeated you? Yeah, him. He's the guy that we gave the offer to let us through his land, and he didn't let us through his land, so we took it from him. Number four, he says, our God gave us this land, and we're going to keep it. It was our God that gave us this land. It was our God that allowed us to take it away from the Amorites and the other inhabitants of Canaan because of their sin, what has your God done for you? What has Chemish done for you? In other words, this is my uh, testimony that I serve a powerful God. 
What's your God done for you? In verse number 28, or 24, pardon me, verse number 24, he kind of rubs a little bit of salt in the wound and kind of digs in a little bit that they're just part of Moab and not an entity in themselves most of the time. And he says, hey, you Moabite wannabes, go back to your god Chemish. That was the god of Moab. Go back to your god Chemish. Um, and cry to him. Ask him why you lost these lands. Ask him why you lost your honor. While you're at it, reviewing that history, go back to your king, the king of Moab, Balak, and, ask, and, and see if he ever strove against Israel. What your God did for you then. Yeah, take a look, take warning, pack your bags and hightail it. And then lastly, in, in verse 26, he says, It's been 300 years since, since you were living here. And you were driven out before then. It's been 300 years since we've been living here. And you were driven out before then. Why haven't you laid claim to this land until now? 300 years is a fair, fairly good time. The United States hasn't been in existence officially for even 250 years. What's the statute of, of limitations on claim to a property? Well, let's just say it's vastly expired here. 300 years and you haven't done anything about it? And so after these solid arguments, these five solid arguments, we come to verse 27 to Jephthah's conclusion. I've not, I've not sinned against you. You are the aggressor here. You came to war against me. You came to plunder and steal and loot. And the Lord God of heaven looked down upon this situation and see that I have held up the, the things that he told us 300 years ago. The commands that he gave us 300 years ago. And I haven't lifted my sword against you. But I'm telling you, if you don't walk away, you're going to feel it. Some pretty solid arguments presented here. Some pretty actual facts of history. Some factual uh, remembrances. And spiritual as well. Of course, the king of Ammon was not in a mood to talk facts. He wanted to settle with fists. And so he accepted neither Jephthah's convincing apologetics nor his convicting appeal to common sense because for 18 years they had uh, sniped and looted and oppressed these people and their lust was not yet satiated. And so now they didn't even only want their crops and money, they wanted their houses and lands as well. The world doesn't want truth. The world doesn't want truth. The world doesn't want common sense thrown in their face. They want what they want no matter how unreasonable it is. We had a poster on our wall when I was growing up. It said, my mind's made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. That's the way the king of, uh, of Ammon was. Sums up his attitude. And so we have here Jephthah's charge. Having done everything possible. To avoid a conflict and having done everything to, uh, possible to honor the Lord, even when he was dealing with God dishonoring people. Jephthah picked up his sword to defend the Lord's inheritance. And he had the blessing of God. The Spirit of God was upon him. It seems as though Jephthah knew that the Spirit of God was upon him. Yet he still doubted. He got a case of the what ifs. And, and we see in verse 30, he says to the Lord, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hand. You know, it's a dangerous place to get to when we make decisions based on feelings. It's a dangerous place to get to when we operate on feelings, and he had a head knowledge that the Lord was with him, and the Lord was blessing him, and he would give him victory, but he just didn't feel it. I know that God promised he would never leave me or forsake me, but I still feel afraid. I know that the Lord promised that if I confess my, faith, my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me my sins, but I still feel dirty. I still feel awful. You know, I, I know God 
said, if I believe in him and call upon his name, I will be eternally saved and secure. But I just don't feel secure. And so sometimes we base our decisions based on feelings, make decisions based on feelings. And it gets us into a dangerous place. And we, we find Jephthah getting into this place with his commitment, Jephthah's commitment or his vow. Some people call it his awful vow. You know, a vow is a good thing. But it should never be entered into in haste or fear. A vow is, is a lovely thing. It is a solemn promise before God or to God himself should never be entered into in, fit, in haste or fear. Makes you wonder what the circumstances were here. What, what le led up to this? It certainly seems that when he made this vow that he didn't have any inkling, any thought even, passing thought, that it would be his wife or daughter that came out. Didn't even cross his mind that his wife or his daughter would be the first one to greet him? Did he have a, a farm full of cattle and sheep and goats and, and, and animals and chickens? And What was it that, that was going through his mind? We don't know. We aren't given the particulars. And you know, as we move down through here, it's often assumed and it's often believed that Jephthah actually offered his daughter as a burnt sacrifice on an altar to the Lord. And God still honored and blessed him. You know, a vow is only valid if it's within the, the law of God. A vow is only... A vow does not supersede the law of God. And here, uh, this would have been a direct violation of the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill... Look, if a vow or a solemn promise in itself justified the breaking of a law, most of the people in prison could be let free. A vow does not supersede the moral law of God. With a cursory read, it appears that Jephthah was a, a little bit hasty in this vow. And though certainly he, he did have the honor to carry it out. This was not something that he learned from his father. He was the son of a harlot. His father had no honor. This is not something he learned from his brothers. They cast him out because of their greed. They wanted their father's inheritance. This is not something he learned from his family. No, this is a tradition that he started with his family. And I say honor, believing that he did carry this out honorably. If indeed he did kill his daughter, as some believe, uh, there would be no honor in it, but rather just determination and grit that he was to be known as a man of his word. It's interesting that God actually leaves no inspired commentary on Jephthah's actions other than the text right here, where we're told that she went away to mourn her virginity and then returned and he did unto her according to his vow. No specific declaration either way that he did not kill her or that he did kill her. But in a day when uh, human sacrifices were common and Jephthah so utterly rejected these gods as he declared clearly to the king of Ammon. He clearly uh, declared that he rejected their gods and he served the true and living God who had given them their land, the Lord, the judge, be judged this day between us. It seems reasonable that he would not return to these or, or turn to these practices when God himself had given him the victory. Furthermore, in the law of Moses, anytime a person is given to God, a animal <clears throat> is sacrificed on their behalf. In, in the book of Exodus... <clears throat> We're told that um, the God, God said that every, the firstborn of man and beast was to be given to the Lord. And then later in the book of Exodus, <clears throat> he said instead of every firstborn, it was going to be the Levites, the tribe of Levites, that would be dedicated unto him in his service of the temple. And whenever 
a man was dedicated, an animal was uh, uh, sacrificed on their behalf. We see that Jesus was brought to the temple in, in dedication and two turtle doves were sacrificed on his behalf. And so <clears throat> the man was not killed, although the firstborn of every beast was still to be given as an actual burnt sacrifice. Jephthah had no God-given right to take the daughter of his, uh, the life of his daughter. It wasn't his to give. I don't believe he did. I believe that his daughter went to Shiloh. The Bible doesn't tell us that. But I personally believe his daughter went to Shiloh and served the Lord for the rest of her life in the temple or tabernacle. And in this way, Jephthah... Uh, remaining a virgin in this way, Jephthah gave her to God and not in marriage to a man. What leads me to this conclusion? Well, in the final verses here of this chapter, we see that his daughter asked for two months to bewail her virginity, not her untimely death. We see that the custom of the daughters uh, getting together to lament for four days a year, I believe that that was with the daughter of Jephthah, not for her. Because they didn't lament her in their own homes. No, they went to, um, sell, uh, to lament with her. In the conclusion of verse number 39, uh, the conclusion of this vow, it says that she knew no man. It doesn't say she died. It says she knew no man. And then fourthly, I think had Jephthah gone through with this abominable plan, he would have broken the moral law of God. And <clears throat> I'm not so sure that he would have been included in Hebrews 11 in the uh, chapter of faith. I'm not so sure that he would have been included as a great man of faith with this horrendous act had he gone through with that. Well, these are my thoughts on Jephthah's vow. You know, some view this in a completely different light, and, and I, I would respect that, and I'm okay with, with that being different, because God has not made it plain. And so I, I, I claim no extra biblical revelation to it. But in conclusion, as we close, I do want to say, or, say, or maybe I should say before we close, I do want to say a few things about vows. The closer your relationship whether it be human or divine, whether your relationship is between God or between a man or woman, the more exclusive and precious your solemn promises should be. That's what a vow is. Jephthah did have this part right. He realized that a promise made to God could not be abandoned just because God gave him his part and he didn't want to keep it anymore. All too many people are abandoning their vows these days and careless, being careless about them. Jesus said in John chapter 15, If ye love me, keep my commandments. And on first read, you might think, Wow, that's a little bit demanding. That's a little bit demanding. If ye love me, keep my commandments? What kind of love is that? That is what a vow is. That is what a close relationship brings. A bond, a promise of two people before God or, or a person with God. A promise, a strong promise because of close love. And you know, the wedding vow is the most common vow we think of today. And for those who solemnly enter into this vow, this promise, bind their hearts by commands to each other. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Solemnly binding themselves to the other person's demands. And you know, if you truly do love your spouse, you will not break these commands. Solomon said, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that uh, thou shouldest not vow than thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. 
Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the, destroy the work of thy hands? It's a good lesson to learn. I do myself believe that God had already answered Jephthah's prayer. I don't think he did need to enter into this vow. I think it was hasty. I do think it was uh, born from fear. And yet Jephthah wanted that feeling of victory before the fight began. And so we're warned in this sense that we need as much care in the making of a vow than we are needing care in the not breaking of a vow. You know, there's something just a little bit sad about the ending of this story. Jephthah got the victory. I personally don't believe that he, he killed his daughter in a, a burnt sacrifice. But my heart kind of goes out for him because it's a sad ending. You know, in chapter 12, the next chapter that we're not going to dig into, uh, a further story is told of him um, in chapter 12 with the Ephraimites coming up against him and, and threatening him. Well, the Ephraimites, throughout the book of Judges, they thought that they were uh, the bad boys. They thought that they were the warriors to be reckoned with, and everybody who was going to war go to war needed to come and consult with them first. They came up against Gideon in the same way, if you remember. And Gideon, who was a little more passive, uh, appeased their anger by saying, What have I done in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of, of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? In other words, it, he, he, he boosted their pride a little bit and said, you guys, you guys did your part. No, you didn't come and fight with me in the 300, but you did your part. And he boosted their pride and, and they're saying, yeah, we were pretty good. I remember the faces of Zeb and Zalmunna when we brought them out of the cave. <laughs> and so he appeased them. But when Jephthah called for them, they didn't come. And when they came and they got mad at Jephthah, it was a different story. It's not Jephthah's style to back down. And he said, uh, when I called for your help, you didn't come. Don't come threaten me. You better be careful with your words because I'll bring it. 42,000 of the Ephraimites fell in chapter 42 because of their big mouths. There's only uh, two other times when Jephthah is mentioned. Just his name. Samuel mentions him once in, in 1 Samuel chapter 12 when he is rehearsing the goodness of God and the deliverances of God. <clears throat> when the children of Israel came and wanted a king. And then we see him once more mention just his name in the uh, Hebrews chapter 11 in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul mentions him. Well, a very interesting character. Just get a glimpse of him here going through, through the book of Judges. That not everybody had turned away from God. It's an encouragement. You know, sometimes we live in a world and it just seems like even people you, you once trusted, that you grew up with, that you looked up to when you grew up, seem to be turning aside. And yet, there's still those like Jephthah that even though they grew up in hard times, still faithful to the Lord. Still, Elijah felt that way. I, I, I am alone. I'm all alone in the land of Egypt, uh, Israel. And um, the Lord said, no, no, 7,000 in Israel have not bowed to Baal bowed the knee to Baal. So it's good to know that the Lord has a reckoning, even though we don't see it. It's good to see that people are faithful. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the story of Jephthah. Some ways we've rushed through and not gotten every detail, but we thank you, Lord, for his life. The fact that he 
gave it over to you. And he didn't get turned aside by the hypocrisy of those that he should have been able to trust. And Lord, I pray that you would help us it to help it to be an encouragement to us and that we would in, in, in like manner be faithful to thee no matter what. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.